Well, hello there. It's good to be here with you. And as I always want to say, thank you for inviting me into your places. And also, we here uh, one week into the new year, and I hope you've had a blessed week. And uh, just uh, so you know, we are beginning a, uh, here at Redwater Alliance, we're beginning a new sermon series in the new year. We're going to go through the letter to the Galatians, uh, verse by verse. So just as a heads up, that would be maybe a good place for you to read, do some reading these next few days. So Liberty Island uh, is located in the upper New York Bay. This 14.6 acres is uh, noted for the Statue of Liberty. Affectionately called Lady Liberty, this copper statue was a gift from the French uh, to celebrate American independence. And the 300 foot tall statue was designed by French sculptor Frederick Bartholdi, Bar Bartholdi and the metal framework was built by Gustav Eiffel of the Eiffel Tower fame. And it can be said that Lady, Lady Liberty has been a symbol of freedom and liberty for the last 137 years. Yet someone once asked concerning Lady Liberty's symbol of freedom, quote, freedom from what? And that's a really good question. When we think about the founding founders of the United States, they would have had a particular oppressor in their minds in their pursuit of freedom and liberty, and that would have been English rule, the rule of King George. David Mathis, who is the executive editor of DesiringGod.com, uh, would suggest that, quote, the cry of liberty is far more ancient than modern liberal liberalism. In other words, for, it's far more ancient than, for example, the mobs of the French Revolution, or certainly more ancient than the documents of the founders of the U.S. Constitution. For Mathis points us back hundreds of years. Matter of fact, over 1,800 years ago, to a declaration of freedom that, math, as Mathis would put it, quote, far predate, predates the cries that inform and distort the popular sense of liberty today. He's pointing back to the Apostle Paul's letter to the Galatian churches where Paul said, For freedom Christ has set us, has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. That's Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. So please turn in your Bibles to Galatians, the letter of Paul to the Galatians. Uh, chapter 1, we're going to uh, read together right through from 1, verse 1 to 9. Chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us for the pre from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Verse 6. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you. As we begin this, uh, uh, this series in the letter to the Galatians, we ask, O oh Lord, that you would help us by your spirit as we go through each of these verses, not only to understand it, but to apply it to our lives and, and also apply it in a way that we, it puts us into action into action with our brothers and sisters, but also to the world around us. And we want to do all this, Lord, for your glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we move further into this new year with this uh, sermon series, God will be our leader and instructor as we go verse by verse through Galatians. And I would encourage you to read through this letter in one sitting many times over. It's only six chapters. It's not that long. Saturate your minds and, with the message of Galatians, and, and you won't be disappointed. In my preparation, um, I was pleasantly reminded, actually I was kind of excitedly reminded, 
of the importance of Galatians and how instrumental it was in Martin Luther's transformation. Paul's clear teaching in Galatians of the doctrine of justification by grace alone through faith alone sparked and lit the fires of the Protestant Reformation so long ago. And friends, Galatians continues today to remind us of the freedom we have because of Jesus Christ. Freedom from sin's punishment and power. Freedom from the sting of death. And friends, not only freedom from, but freedom to. Freedom to have godly relationships. Freedom to serve others as God has called us to. Freedom to love as God has loved us and, and so much more. So as we go through these 149 verses of Galatians, my prayer is that we will not only discover freedom from and freedom to, but that we would embrace wholeheartedly the freedom we have in Christ alone. So let's, we need to step back a little bit in time to the Apostle Paul's first missionary journey, which is recorded for us in, in the book of Acts, um, in chapter 13 and 14. We also should keep in mind that the early years of the church were predominantly made up of Jewish Christian believers. And as the persecution against these Jewish Christians would increase in Jerusalem, they would disperse and leave Jerusalem to other points in the empire. And one such location was north of Jerusalem in what was then known as Syria and to a place called Antioch. In Acts chapter 13 and 14, we find that it was at Antioch, Syria, that the Apostle Paul was set apart to go to the Gentiles with the gospel message. And Luke records this event for us in chapter 13 of Acts, verses 2 and 3, where we read, While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So Paul and Barnabas set off on the first missionary journey that's recorded for us in the book of Acts. And along the way, Paul and Barnabas would visit a number of locations. And, f and they would visit five towns in the area that was then known as Galatia, which is modern-day Turkey. They visited Pisidium, Antioch, Galatia, or Antioch, Turkey, not Syria, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. And it was at the and as it was the habit of Paul, pardon me on that one, that he would go first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. So the long and short of it, churches were planted by Paul and Barnabas on this first missionary journey, and for our purposes, those five that I just mentioned in Galatia. This letter was written to the churches in Galatia. With this background in mind, let's turn our attention to Paul's letter to the Galatians. Verse 1, we find Paul's typical introductory greeting. Paul, an apostle. He did this in all his letters. Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ. He was set aside by Christ to bring the gospel primarily to the Gentiles. And Luke gives us the account of Paul's conversion in the book of Acts chapter 9. We see there in chapter 9 that Paul was on his way to Damascus with letters of authority to arrest the followers of the way. That's what they were called in the early days. And along the way, he encountered Jesus Christ. And in that same event, we find that Jesus, speaking to the faithful Ananias about Paul, said this in Acts 9.15. He, that is Paul, is a chosen instrument of mine, that is Jesus, to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Paul was writing with the authority given to him as an apostle of Jesus Christ, as he put it here in verse 1, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. And I want to say on the aside, contrary to those in the church today who call themselves apostles, Paul was the authentic apostle. Today's so-called self-proclaimed apostles are not authentic apostles. They are imitations, they are fakes, and they should be avoided but, of course, I digress. Back to our text. Verse 2, as I mentioned, alluded to earlier, tells us who Paul was writing to, to the churches in Galatia. And verse 3, Paul continues with a standard greeting that you would find in his other letters as well. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now we come to verse 4. And I want to park ourselves here for a few moments. So let's read verse 3 and 4 together. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now verse 4. Who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. The IVP New Testament commentary comments that Paul here was at verse 4, quote, outlining the basic structure of his Christ-centered message. So let's break this down together. Let's notice this phrase in verse 4, who gave himself for our sins. This is speaking about Jesus who did this. Paul here pointing to the sacrificial work of Christ on the cross. The sacrificial work of Jesus Christ on the cross is the epicenter, if you will, of Paul's gospel message. We could say this sort of in a negative sense, negative sense pardon me, to make the point. No bodily death of Christ on the cross, no gospel of Christ. No gospel of Christ, no Christianity. Friends, the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ was, as the IVP put it so well, quote, the final answer to the problem of all our moral failure and guilt. And when one reads through Paul's letter, we find that the victory over sin accomplished by the cross of Christ is a major theme of his letter. Turn with me, if you will, to chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. There Paul said this, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. We could also go to chapter 3, verse 13. And there Paul said this, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. You could also go to chapter 4, verse 4. You go to chapter 5, verse 1, 11, and 24, and to other places in his letter. So Paul, throughout the letter, has one message to the Galatians. The sacrificial death of Christ on the cross is dealt with the sin problem once for all. And because of this, you have freedom in Christ. Let's go to the next phrase. To deliver us from the present evil age. Here Paul points to the purpose of Christ's sacrificial death. To deliver or to rescue all who believe in the death of Christ on the cross. And let's keep in mind that this deliverance, this rescue, was always part and parcel of God's redemptive plan and purpose. And Paul had this view in mind. For God has revealed his promised Messiah, Jesus Christ, at the right time in history. Christ's death and resurrection has forever, forevermore changed the course of human history, changed human history. The cross of Christ has initiated God's new creation. Paul would say it this way in his second letter to Corinth, chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And the question is, where is this from? Well, the answer is in verse 4, according to the will of our God and Father. So to recap, a major theme that we find here in Galatians is the sufficiency of Christ's death on the cross to deal with the sin of the whole world as described for us in John 3, 16 and 18. And unlike the continual re-sacrificing of Jesus Christ in the Roman Catholic Mass, Christ's death on the cross is not only sufficient to deal with the sin problem completely, but Christ has dealt with it once for all. As the writer to the Hebrews would say, we have been sanctified to the offering of Jesus Christ once for all. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. And this sufficient one-time sacrifice of Christ was according to, the will, according to the will of our God and Father and for his glory. Not from, as Paul would put it in verse 1, not from man nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Well, now we come to verses 6 to 9. And here, these verses answers the question, why did Paul write his letter to the Galatian churches? Well, it's pretty clear when you read this letter, very soon into it, that false teachers had visited the Galatian churches after Paul and Barnabas had planted them, teaching that along with the cross of Christ, 
one needed to live according to Jewish customs of well. For example, if you were a male Gentile Christian believer, you would be required to be circumcised and adopt other Jewish religious customs as well. And it looks like the Judaizers, that's what they were called, were gaining some traction for Paul. Or some traction for Paul said in verse six I, six, I am amazed that you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. I have a question for you to ponder. How long do you think, how long have false teachers and false prophets been teaching and prophesying falsely? How long? How long? How many centuries? Well, the answer really is found in the Bible and it's found in Genesis. So from the very moment sin entered through Adam, from the moment Adam doubted God and accepted Satan's lie that we, we, we read for ourselves here, in Genesis 3, chapter 1, Genesis 3, verse 1 through 7. You will not surely die, Satan said, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Eat of what? Eat from the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden that was forbidden for Adam to eat from. From that moment, false teachers and false prophets have questioned the word of God all along the way. Question the words of those that God called to teach and prophesy his word. And the cross of Christ in our day, here in the 21st century, has been psychologized, philosophized, and contextualized to death. The cross of Christ for many today is nothing but a symbol, some bling to wear around the neck. For many have bought into the lie of Genesis 3 and thereby nullify the power of the cross. For Paul said in Romans chapter 1, 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So considering all this, I just want to spend a few minutes here, a few moments, um, giving you an example of a false teacher from ancient times that continues to impact the church to this day, to this day. So it was during the 5th century, there was a, a fellow by the name Pelagius. He was a British monk, and eventually he found his way to Rome. Well, we know about Pelagius, that he was known for his piety, his virtue, his morality. Yet when he went to Rome, he quickly discovered that most Romans were not so interested in piety, morality, and virtue. Now, that shouldn't have surprised anybody, I imagine. But anyways, Pelagius felt that this problem in Rome was due to the teaching of another Christian by the name of Augustine, who emphasized the grace of God in a person's salvation and life. Pelagius became known for his heretical teaching that, what, that we call today Pelagianism. In essence, Pelagius denied original sin. He taught that every person was born morally neutral. People can sin, but also people are able not to sin. In other words, the grace of God was helpful, but it was not necessary for someone to attain eternal life. Human free will was sufficient to accomplish eternal life. Well, the bottom line is this. Pelagius denied the substitutionary atonement of Christ. And because of Pelagius' influence in Rome and other places and heretical teaching, he was excommunicated and condemned during some of the councils of those days, for example, in Ephesus and Carthage. Yet even though Pelagius was dealt with, and we don't know whatever happened to him, it was shortly thereafter that another heresy reared its ugly head. And this one we, we call semi-Pelagianism. Now, semi-Pelagianism teaches that salvation is a cooperative effort between God's grace and human free will. This newer heresy was also condemned by the early church and dealt with at the Council of Orange. Sadly, semi-pelagialism continues to this day to be the default position for the most of humanity. And although semi-pelagialism is officially condemned by most conservative Christians today, the reality is that semi-pelagialism is alive and well and many, whether they recognize it or not, are themselves semi-Pelagians. Paul said to the Galatians, But even if we, 
or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. What was Paul doing here? He was making his appeal to the Galatian churches, as he did to the Roman church, where he said there in that letter to Rome, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles to the doctrine that you have been taught, avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. Romans 16, verse 17 and 18. So when we consider our time, our context, the 21st century Western Evangelical Church, false teachers and their teaching are alive and well today. So for our purposes, we can group much of what is being taught falsely into three false gospels. Three false gospels, just generally, I guess. So first we have the prosperity gospel. Jesus is the way to wealth, health, and prosperity. Also called the Word of Faith movement, it is the fastest growing movement in the evangelical church today worldwide. Secondly, there's a self-help gospel. The self-help gospel. This is the me first movement in the church today. This gospel is all about you and me. Preachers of the self-help gospel read you and me into the Bible text everywhere. Their message is how to become a better you. How to defeat the Goliaths in your life, etc., etc. And preaching really has just become an extended TED Talk with the occasional reference to Jesus. And some of it is outright outrageous and ridiculous. Thirdly, there is a political gospel. One article described the political gospel in this way. Quote, This gospel is not dangerous because of what one claims to believe, but because of what, of what one believes functionally. The key word there is functionally. Yes, one can claim Jesus is Lord, yet place their hope in a political party and their candidates. Well, friends, what's happening with these three false gospels in our context today is each of these false gospels elevate man, elevate humanity, and bring down, bring down Christ to human level. The Apostle Paul called the Judaizers of his day false teachers and marked them to be avoided. We would be wise to do likewise today with those who preach another gospel. As I bring this to a close, I, I wanted to share a, a quote from Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon was a Baptist preacher in the 1800s. He was, uh, became known as the Prince of Preachers, and, and his life is a story, is a remarkable story uh, of, of pain and and, uh, and depression and the grace and mercy of God throughout all of it. And the quote goes like this. Human wisdom delights to trim and arrange the doctrine of the cross into a system more artificial and more congenial with the depraved tastes of fallen nature. Instead, however, of improving the gospel, carnal wisdom pollutes it until it becomes another gospel and not the truth of God at all. Friends, let us pray together. Lord God, Thank you so much for this letter to the Galatians, written so long ago to a people living so long ago in a world so far away from where we are here in Canada. And I pray, Lord, that we would heed the words of Paul's gospel, that Christ is sufficient once for all for the sin of the world, for my sin, for anyone's sin, once for all sacrificed, no more needs to be re-sacrificed day in and day out. Lord, as uh, Spurgeon said, the carnal mind wants to navigate and pollute the true gospel of Christ and the cross. Help us to not do that, Lord, in these days. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for um, being or having me with you. Uh, just have a great day. Uh, shalom.